We're going to talk about the physiology of labor and the analgesia that can be offered for that. First is a discussion of just how labor works. So if we plot cervical dilation versus time, there are three stages to labor. The first stage uh, begins with the beginning of cervical dilation, the beginning of regular uterine contractions, and that can vary considerably and is a very subjective uh, statement on the part of the mom when she feels like they started and didn't stop. Um, and that goes until complete dilation. Complete dilation, complete effacement. And that is divided into two phases. The first is a slow dilation and then a more rapid one. So the slow dilation is called the latent phase and that is of extremely variable duration because of this inability to tell where the beginning of it is. At some point there is this acceleration phase that usually happens somewhere between three and five centimeters but really can only be uh, defined by looking at the labor curve afterwards and seeing where it occurred. This rapid phase is called the active phase and the rate of that is highly variable. There's some very old data from uh, Friedman, that's why these are called Friedman curves, that said that a multip, so someone who's had a baby before, should be dilating at 1.5 centimeters per hour and a prime ip, uh, first baby, should be dilating at 1.2 centimeters per hour. And these were, in his data, the fifth percentile. So people should be dilating way faster than that. It doesn't appear that our patients, at least, go this fast. The World Health Organization sets um, their alert bar at one centimeter per hour. So any patient, as you plot this curve, if the slope of it becomes less than one centimeter per hour, they advocate transferring that patient to a hospital that can do a cesarean delivery. Of course, they're dealing mostly with the third world. There are um, all sorts of aberrations to this, extended latent phases, very slow active phases, uh, patients who get into the active phase and then all of a sudden stop, um, people who come up and sort of stay there for a while and then go up again. Um, so it's only a over time that you can look at it and, and decide exactly where they are. Um, another interesting feature of this is the way that we assess cervical dilation is, um, as you know, the, the fingers. And it turns out that even intra-observer, so you give a mechanical cervix to the same physician two times in a row and they're plus or minus one centimeter. So if you're looking every two hours and you're hoping to see a centimeter an hour, you could have anywhere from zero dilation to two centimeters and, and you really can't tell. And so that's part of the reason why we, there's not much use in, in uh, doing cervical exams any more frequently than every three hours. Stage two of labor, the onset of that is complete dilation until delivery. The um, duration of that is expected to be one hour in a multip who does not have an epidural, two hours if they do, and then two hours in a prime ip without an epidural, and three hours if they do. And the reason that an epidural prolongs things is primarily because they lose some motor strength and also the urge to push and the strength and the um, directional force of the push. Um, and so when we get outside of these numbers, then we start thinking about a failure of descent and the possibility of the need for a C-section. Stage three, then, is, is just the placenta, to delivery of the placenta. And we would like that to be less than 30 minutes. And when that gets to be excessive, we start worrying about an accreta, something like that. Okay, so now we'll talk a little about the pain of labor. In stage one, during this the latent phase and then this active phase, the majority of the pain is coming from the uterus itself. So here's a uterus and we'll make pain red. 
um, all of the innervation of the uterus comes out through the cervix at a place called Frankenhauser's plexus and then joins with sympathetic nerves up into the sympathetic chain and then ends up entering between T10 and L1. So from there you can see that there are numerous places where you could block this. If you block right here at the cervix, you will block all first stage labor pain. It's a paracervical block. Unfortunately, the uterine artery also comes through the cervix and so the baby would absorb the artery would absorb a large amount of local anesthetic deliver that to the baby and so there's an unacceptable rate of fetal bradycardia from paracervical block. As the nerves come up here you could do a lumbar sympathetic block and cover them and that has been done. You have to do it bilaterally and we at least when the studies were done they didn't have a catheter technique for that so it was multiple injections but it does cover it and would be very nice um, potentially in our coagulopathic patients that we could offer lumbar sympathetic blocks. I personally have never done one and, and uh, don't think that'd be the avenue to, to try my first one. Um, paravertebral blocks is also a possibility. Again, these are not done uh, anywhere for labor. And, and then the most common is this epidural and, or intrathecal. Um, and what you need to block is T10 to L1 and that'll cover first stage labor pain. So then we get to second stage. So that's all first stage, and we'll do second stage in a different color. Second stage is from open from the distension of the vagina and pressure on the perineum itself, and that is all pudendal. So they can do a pudendal nerve block, and this is both of these are done by the obstetricians, not by us. Um, those blocks work when done properly. Our obstetricians don't get to do them very often, so when they do them they have a lower success rate, so then they're less interested in doing them. Um, so here, pudendal blocks are very rarely done. And then we can cover it um, with a, really our epidural. We just dose up enough to cover down here, but if you are taking care of a patient who's already almost complete and you're trying to cover it, you could do it with a spinal that we keep them sitting up and just get these roots, and that's called a saddle block. I think you're trying to numb everything that would touch a saddle. Um, or a caudal, although those are not very practical in obstetrics. The stage three is the same as stage two, and also if you have to do a repair afterwards, again, you're needing to cover S2 through four in the somatic um, nerves. What is the, what are the options for labor analgesia? Of course, you can read about prepared childbirth. The, so the first option is sort of nothing. The second option is let me read a two here so you know where that comes from. Um, the next least invasive is IV opioids. And it turns out they don't actually work terribly well for labor. If you ask women during a contraction how much the opioid has helped in the active phase of labor, it's not much. But they are able to rest in between um, without the anxiety and the anticipation of the next contraction. So there is some benefit from them. They do cross. Anything that can get into the mom's brain can get across the placenta. So there is significant narcotic in the baby. And it turns out Demerol is your worst choice because it ion traps in the baby. Opioids are still used all over the world. Um, we tend to shy away from them for several reasons, including their effects on the fetal heart rate tracing. Another choice is these pudendals and paracervicals. Those are done by the obstetrician and uh, are rarely done, particularly paracervicals because of that risk of fetal um, bradycardia that I mentioned. Um, and then really the next is the neuraxial. And there, um, epidural would be the most common. Then another one that we do frequently is a CSE. So that is an epidural. And once you get in the epidural space, you slide a tiny needle through it and do a tiny dose intrathecally. So it's a combined spinal epidural. 
and then we run the epidural for labor pain for the rest of the labor. And then continuous spinals are becoming more common, particularly in our larger patients, because they convert for a cesarean very easily, very reliably. Um, but most often we're doing them um, as a consequence of an inadvertent wet tap. We're threading a catheter and running them as a continuous spinal. It's um, fairly effective and it may help reduce the risk of a postural puncture headache. What's the effect of neuraxial anesthesia on labor? Um, as you saw on the description of how fast labor should be, when you add an epidural, they allow a slower labor before they get worried about needing a C-section. Um, so it does uh, increase stage one um, by approximately two hours, and it increases stage two by about 20 minutes. Um, those are not those numbers vary in every paper that you'll read. Um, despite that sort of bad press, the incidence of the use of neuraxial anesthesia is about 75 to 80 percent in hospitals that have greater than 1,500 deliveries a year, and it's down around 57 percent in tiny hospitals that have less than 500 deliveries a year, and primarily that's because of the availability of anesthesia services.